and welcome everyone. I'm Nick Best, CEO here at Astranti, and I'm delighted today to have with us um, Mark Foley from SEMA, the Director of Relationship uh, uh, Programs. Hi, Mark. Hi, Nick. Thanks for having me. That's all right. Do you, do you want to maybe just spend a couple of minutes just introducing who you, who you are, um, just to uh, introduce yourself? Sure, yes. So I have been within the uh, accountancy training sector now for, gosh, I'm getting old, Nick, over 20 years. So uh, my background is I used to teach one of the training providers and I taught the SEMA qualification for well over 15 years. And I joined uh, SEMA within the last two years. And my role there is to collaborate with training providers and to create new learning and support content to uh, help our students through their SEMA exam journey. Um, yeah, I think that's that's about it, Nick. Well, what, um, I know one thing you're going to cover and our real folks today is you've got these kind of 10 steps that you've kind of put together you think are kind of critical for students. But before we kind of head into that, what, what led you to be an accountant in the first place? Well, you know, how did you kind of get into the, 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 the yeah. field, as it were? Well, to be honest, I don't, think I ever had that conscious decision when I was young thinking I want to be an accountant but what I do like in accountancy too is it's like a rugby team that there's every type of um, sports you know physicality can make it into a rugby team so you can be large or you can be uh, not quite as stocky and you could be a forward so there's just so many different types of accounting roles and um, I have friends that are accountants that are completely different to me and highly analytical and they found themselves in forensics. Whereas I, um, I, I suppose, I, I kind of drifted into it. I knew I wanted to be in business. I knew I wanted mm -hmm. to understand um, the basics of finances to make sure that I could budget my own finances correctly. Yeah. I wondered whether I might set myself up in, in business at some point myself. And, you know, people were telling me at the time, my parents, that, well, you probably need some financial acumen to do that. Um, and in the end, one of the things I wanted to do was to travel and to travel with work. And again, I was aware that there was lots of accounting firms out there that, uh, that could offer secondments overseas, etc. And at a young age, that was very appealing. So I think they were, I suppose, the reasons why. And I'm so so pleased I did. It, it's given me a very varied career. And even within the work that I've done in the accounting sector, it, it has led me to be able to write. It's led me to lecture. Um, I've even branched out into things like account management. I've run sales teams before. I've run... Okay. Uh, uh, training provider centres. So uh, it feels as if I've had many different disciplines, but still within the accounting sector. It's amazing. It's actually as much well, when I went into accounting as well, it was very much that too, actually hearing your story. I, I knew I wanted to go into business and it was a way in. And actually, much like you, it was the variety of opportunities once you qualified that actually made me think, well, you know, I can do this. I have that behind me. And yeah, it's interesting, and yeah, it's uh, it's interesting to hear the various things that that you go. And I've got a friend that's an accountant, and he runs the HR um, department at his accountancy firm. Um, and it's kind of well, how did you end up in HR? You know, <laughs> and uh, another friend who's a, a market researcher, and he's I think he's chairman of the Market Research Society. And it, isn't it amazing how from that starting point, it actually gives that. And both of us ended up as tutors, yeah. of course. So, yeah, yeah. You, you know, you do just. Don't just become an accountant. It's that back business background that actually oh, gives yes. lots of opportunity. It's so transferable, Nick. That's the thing. There's so many different functional uh, departments that have some reliance on basic financial acumen as well, and how that can influence. So, um, yeah, never look back. And you, you mentioned um, teaching there. I, I, I do recall being offered the chance to, to teach, and I... I uh, I had uh, to do like a, a pilot lecture. And okay. I must admit, yeah. I don't know if it was the same for you, Nick. I knew within five minutes, I knew within five minutes I'd found my vocation. I, don't, really? I knew that was something I was going to stick yeah. in for the rest of my career if somebody would have me. So, yeah, <laughs> and I've enjoyed it ever since. Were you the same, Nick? Was it obvious to you? 
it was um, I knew I wanted to be there to support people. And, you know, I did accounting for three years. Actually, I did marketing at my firm, which was PwC. I did that for two years and I really wanted to work with people. And so it was the natural way in was go and become a, a tutor because I knew I'd then be working with people and supporting people, helping people to learn and develop. And, you know, m much like you, it's been 23 years now for me as a, a tutor. Um, so, uh, yeah, so. You know, and a pleasure, actually. You know, I've, I've loved it. I really have. So we're actually, we're doing very well to sell tutoring here, aren't we, Mark? Definitely. People will be listening and thinking, oh, yeah, I'll go and be a tutor. But actually, you know, there's, you know, and most people would be going to become management accountants, obviously. Um, but yeah, I've got a, a friend who's just, um, he's recently, the company's been sold. He's been a director of that company for 20 years in a, a an operations role. And the difficulty he's got now is because he doesn't have the qualification behind him is what does he do? He's got his experience. But uh, I think one of the things with being a qualified accountant is that you've always got that behind you and failing anything else, you could always go and become a, an accountant somewhere. You know, so I, I also think having the having the qualification is always has been a huge amount of security in my life. I don't know about you but it's, it's always something that's there and there's always been a uh, you know that that role there in the background which is always a great help yeah. yeah no i'm with you on that one so um okay so tell me you developed these these 10 steps for um uh, that you think are critical for students passing their exam what led you into um into developing those steps um well that's a good question nick i think that one of the things that i've learned over the years from the accountancy students that I've met is, um, well, how much fun it's been, how clever they are, how committed they are, and how logical they are too. And I um, used to teach some of um, uh, the, the in, in the past, the more wordy, I suppose, um, less numerical papers. Okay. And that, I often thought was was less technical content, but often proved a real challenge to some of the students who were very used to logic sequence and some of the answers required, you know, for case study requires more of a holistic view, doesn't it? And it requires you to synthesize different models, etc. And uh, and so I started to to put advice and tips into a framework, into steps and Mm -hmm. It seems to have worked very well. So that was the first thing for doing these, you know, uh, steps to kickstart learning, steps to improve recall, for example. I put everything into a sequence of steps and that seems to really work. Um, secondly, uh, I look back in horror at some of the mistakes I made when I started my accounting learning journey, which we'll go on to shortly. And I... I think that's another reason for this vocation. If there's anything I can do to stop uh, any any student from or any learner making the mistakes I did, then this has been very worthwhile. And although a lot of the steps are, you know, quite simple, I, I'm kind of hoping that uh, anyone that is, you know, willing to listen to us in this recording, I hope they can pick up at least one thing that they've not thought about, or even something that they've forgotten that. Just reminding themselves of and these steps really are focusing on the getting started stage the mm -hmm. actual learning stage so i'm really interested in the kind of the motivation to start where to start so many students i, I meet this i just don't know where to start um, so um, these steps will cover that um, and it really goes up to the revision stage so if it, this is something that your students uh, value, we could always do another one, Nick, where we look at what revision would look like and your exam day, for okay. example. So a separate advice for that. So this really is is more for those students who are have started recently or have started and been distracted, started and they faced challenges. Um, we're living in such challenging times at the moment that maybe study doesn't seem very important when when actually. It could be that that study becomes even more critical as, uh, you know, having a qualification behind you, you know, makes mm. you far more job ready and job worthy. So um, these really are tips in the hope that somebody somewhere is listening to this and thinks, 
I'm going to start studying again with a strand team. So that's my uh, my hope. OK, great. So do you want to kick us off with your first step then? Sure. Yeah. So um, as I say, um, it, just bear with us as we go through this, because I'm hoping there's one in here that might resonate with the audience somewhere. But the first one really is to start with the end in mind. So have a very clear objective of what it is you're trying to achieve. Now, this might be something as simple as I want to sit and pass my E1 exam in three months time. So that would make a, a very good objective in that it's smart, it's specific, measurable, achievable, relevant and timely. So having a, an end goal in mind and I, I've met lots of tutors over the years that have said, once you have that end goal in mind, write it down, have it somewhere visually that you can see on a regular basis to remind you know, what you committed to. But I think it's more than that. I think the reason for having the end in mind is you really want to ask yourself, why? Why are you doing this? Why are you about to embark on this study period? And the reason why that is so important is if you're absolutely clear as to the reasons why, that's where your sense of, of drive, mm, that's your, really. your motivation, your urge to achieve. It's that Sunday night maybe when it's raining outside and the last thing you want to do maybe at that particular point is study. But the, what's that thing that's gonna force you to do it? And in many ways, suppose the first step is not just trying to say why, but have you really made that commitment to a study period, which involves some form of sacrifice? And I've met that thousands of students over the years and very few of them can actually get through their senior exams without much learning or study. So the rest of us, including myself, did have to go through a period of study that I was committed to. And for me personally, what was it? Uh, if you don't mind me sharing, uh, it, was, it, it was it was partly monetary uh, at the time. I didn't have a lot of money. And yeah, I thought yeah. that the, the qualification and the study would be a way to advance my qualification. And as a young man, it seemed at the time things like a, a nice car was important to me. <laughs> uh, so th these were my motivations, which I'm a little ashamed of now. No, I'm sure. I'm sure there are many people in that <laughs> that same boat as well. And it kind of comes back to what we were talking about earlier as well, doesn't it? About things like I talked a little bit about security, and probably actually people don't think about that actually when they're they're starting their studies. But it's something when I look back, that's been a huge benefit a benefit to me. The different opportunities, career is another one. It could be the people really want to get on. And actually, you know, there's this sort of ceiling of, often in the accountancy world, unless you're qualified, it's very hard to, to get jobs, um, and, you know, because they always ask for that qualification. So, you know, and, and I think it's probably different for everyone. Some people probably just do it because they, you know, they want a sense of achievement. Just, I want to pass that exam and show I've got it. But yeah, I, I completely sympathize with the money one as well. You know, I think, <laughs> I think that's... I don't. I, I suspect that would be quite near the top of many people's uh, people's lists too. I feel better. Okay, and I think that's so important. It is that, is that, like you said, that sort of sense of, you know, where's this coming from? What's all this about for me? Why is it important? Because it is hard. You know, if you're studying for three, four years, and you're doing it, you know, on your evenings and weekends, on top of a really busy day at work, you know, you've got to get that drive from somewhere, and you know, it might be easy for a while but actually you've kind of got to push beyond at times too to get that so absolutely great so what's your second step so this um is a step i've inherited from a colleague of mine clancy that i work alongside so this is one that he's added and it's know where you are now so i asked him clancy what do you mean by know where you are now and what he was really suggesting is that maybe students might want to try to perform their own SWOT analysis on themselves. Okay. You know, what are their strengths? What are their weaknesses, their opportunities and their threats? And I suppose, looking back now, I think, gosh, that, that's such a clever thing to do at the beginning of a study journey. Because what he's really saying is, what obstacles can you see ahead that you can limit 
mitigate or try to overcome now. So in other words, what can you do to significant, sorry, to significantly improve your chances of exam success before you actually start studying? So the examples that Clancy give, uh, for example, is it could be something as you study environment. So is a threat to your exam success that you don't have a conducive study environment? So for example, it could be that your study environment is, is it's noisy. Now I use that as an example because actually there's some students out that would say, no, that's a real strength of mine. I, I see that as an opportunity almost that if I could find somewhere that is a little noisy, uh, you know, a bit of background noise, it really helps them. Some people like to have some soft music playing in the background, it helps them, but yeah. to others, it's no distraction. Uh, sorry, it is a big distraction. So knowing this in advance and, and be able to, to change your study environment, or um, I think a threat for me as a young man studying many years ago was my friends. Um, and yeah. Uh, one of the ways to mitigate that was to, to get in touch with them and say, for the next two months, please don't invite me out. Just leave me to my study. And it felt like a sacrifice that. And that sacrifice was important because it made the achievement feel even sweeter that mm -hmm. I had given up things. I, I hadn't seen my friends or my family as much as I wanted or do the you know, maybe some of my hobbies that I wanted to do. But gosh, when on qualification, uh, um, I received my certification, it did feel so much more sweeter because I'd actually gone through some form of sacrifice. So know where you are now, what your strengths are, you know, what your weaknesses, and how can you take those, those threats, you know, it could even be things like work commitments and, and spending time with a um, someone in HR or a learning development uh, manager to, to, to talk about the period of study that you want to do and does it fit in with month end or year end routines? Yeah. What times can you not be committed to study is as important as the times that you are. And knowing that up front will give you more of an idea of your levels of commitment to study, when you can study and when you can take your exam. And I can see it can actually be quite broad as well, couldn't it? I'm thinking of, you know, some people might be very good, say, at numerical subjects, other people better at maybe the more, uh, maybe what would be case studies and more written based subjects. And, and you might think, OK, well, I'm, you know, I'm good at the written ones, so I can, I don't need so long to study that. But, you know, the numerical ones, I need longer to get in my head. So it could be things like that as well. I have a, a student question for you that kind of okay. relates to this. So one of the threats for, um, I'm going to get, get his uh, pronunciation right. Uh, Apina Pande is, uh, how can I improve, because study courses are so costly, um, often about 550 euro. And I think, you know, and I can see actually from that point of view, that's everyone's on different budgets and some people, maybe their companies are paying and they've got all the courses and all the material, other people on a limited budget. So I'm going to throw this one at you, Mark, at this stage as well. What do you think, people on a limited budget, What's the, you know, what would, if that was one of their threats or limits, how would you advise them to kind of go about and go through their studies? Yeah, well, we'll, we'll go through some steps that will help me to, to answer that one. Um, there is a huge amount of free resources that are out there. Mm -hmm. There are established training providers that will have uh, different courses for different budgets. In fact, if you don't mind me saying, I mean, Astranti have been fantastic here in terms of being able to offer um, courses that are extremely reasonably priced that will allow some form of structured learning, uh, mm -hmm. which I think is so important. So, I mean, if you don't mind me uh, saying, Nick, it, do you mind if I just pass the question back to you, simply because out of all the providers that I know, the, the range of courses that you offer and also the, uh, the, the I suppose, the, the, the to be able to work within the budgets of those that uh, have a limited spend um, is something that you excel at. Is there something in particular that, that might be useful for the student here? Well, I would say, I mean, in terms of, you know, we, we have the full courses, which, yeah, would be that price or case study, um, potentially even more. But what I would say is, is get the resources that are right for you. So, 
you know, if someone just wants, um, if you're, uh, 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 you know, you, you study well from a study text, then the study text for a very low price, be it the official one or our study text, I think you've got actually all the base material you need there for um, what would be sort of 30 pounds or so mock exams. And I know you can probably going to cover that later. I think you can just buy the mock exams, buy the practice kits, buy the mock exams. And actually, if you've done those two things as a minimum, that will push you a huge way forward towards passing. And of course, yes, it's a great advantage if you go on a full course and have on have all the support. But and but it's actually it's, it's picking and mixing from the various you know, we have revision notes and mock exams and other practice questions and the case study, you know, a whole load of resources that we can probably talk about. But actually, it's pick and mixing within your budget. What is what is right for you? And I think I actually like you. There's also quite a lot of free resources out there as well. So I think, you, you know, it, it is about trying to make the most of those those uh, opportunities if you're on to budgets. It's definitely worth just picking Another point that was mentioned there, Nick, when you were alluding to the fact that some courses you will find very easy, you know, it's a numerical paper perhaps, or there's uh, another SEMA paper that's um, less numerical they might like, there's many different um, topics and disciplines in there. It is worth pointing out that every student at some point in their journey will find a or more papers difficult and others very straightforward. So, yeah. for example, I, I've taught students that were, were prize winners in a, in a particular subject and then other papers really struggled with, you know, with, with marginal scores, which is wonderful that they pass. But it is important to, to, you know, appreciate that everyone does feel like they're in the same boat, you know, not, not you know, very, very clever, very intelligent students. They, they still have their own challenges and some challenging papers. So. Um, I don't know. It's one of the things that I used to mention a lot in lectures that um, when I, I think about all the students that I've taught, uh, they were all, the majority of them by far, all fell into a bracket. And that bracket was between the scores of, you know, maybe a 40 to 10 percent to an 80 percent. But they all seem to fall within that bracket. And we talked a lot about, well, What's the elements of success that can move those 40 percenters up to a past yeah. standard? And, and by and large, I found it wasn't competence. It was technique and confidence. And that's mm. another reason why we'll continue around this, this little, uh, these tips to kickstart learning, because I'm hoping that some of them might have an impact on eventual marks. Oh, absolutely. OK, so do you want to hit us with your, um, your, your third step then? OK, now this is a tricky one because it's, I think, the most simple, the most significant one, but the one that often gets ignored, and that is plan to succeed. And what I really mean is a study timetable. Now, I've tried over many years to convince students to do a study timetable, and some of them just look at me as if I'm patronising them. I don't need a study timetable, Mark. Why do I need one? I'm organized, I'm self-directed, I just don't need one. I think there's many reasons. First of all, it's a sense of control. If this is something your study is within your control. And the more you have those feelings of control, the more confidence you have in passing. So for anyone that does like to feel in control with their study, it's vital. Secondly, Let's just take an average paper. Let's say it's an objective paper, E1. Now, the recommendation from SEMA is that if you are using learning resource and self-directed, then that course should last about 120 hours. So if you were studying for, say, let's say 10 hours per week, you've got a 12-week or a three-month course there. So my timetable would show in three months time an exam date when I'm choosing to perform and sit the actual exam. And the point there is I'll then work backwards and think, OK, I'm going to need 10 hours of study. I must point out some people might need more. 
some yeah. people might need a lot fewer hours because they're using a learning provider. But this is just an illustrative guide. So if I've got 10 hours worth of study to do in a week, and then maybe some of you are employed, so you've got to put your work commitments in there, family commitments, those weddings that you can't get out of. Um, and then what's left? Is there 10 hours that you can very reasonably commit to with everything else in your lives? Um, we've been so lucky recently to have engaged with some uh, learners who are working parents and they're finding that the best time for them to study is actually 4 or 5 a.m. in the morning before their kids wake up. But they're timetabling it and it's structured and it's within their control. So um, I definitely suggest for anyone that finds prioritization or time management an issue to perform a study plan and, and maybe it's a you know done electronically in a google calendar um, but i think the final thing to say is whenever i perform surveys uh, and ask students about their their learning challenges the number one answer or their main obstacle is finding the time to study and mm -hmm. so I would always say, put a plan together. And if you find that you haven't enough time to commit to a period of study, then it could be that you might have to move your goalpost. So in other words, have it four months rather than three. And does that work? But what I would suggest is once you've made that commitment, stick to it. It's probably the key. Yeah, I, I know that uh, I know one thing that makes a huge difference is getting into the habit of you know, so you have your plan and I'm going to do two hours on a Monday and two on a Wednesday, four on a Saturday, four, whatever it might be, and then committing to it. But it always becomes the thing that you do. I kind of liken it a little bit to exercising. You know, you exercising on certain days and then you will keep on doing it because of that. And yeah. I think having that plan to start with and then committing to it after a couple of weeks, it starts to become just what you do in life. And actually, it's quite hard initially to kind of push you out of you know, the, all your other commitments. But then after a while, you know, yeah, I do do I do my 10 hours and I do it on certain days and, uh, and and I will do that. So, yeah, to me, it's like kind of having that plan and then committing and then just getting into the habit. And then, you know, there's no doubt that once you um, put those hours in, that's in the end what is the biggest difference between, between people passing and failing. And actually, if you can do it in a structured way, like the first eight weeks is learning, the left second four weeks, uh, the last four weeks is revision and practicing questions and, you know, and it's all structured like that. So much more chance of passing completely. It is, but you have to be honest. That's the challenge. Yeah. You have to be honest. So, for yeah. example, um, when students will say to me, I quite like my weekends free, but I'm going to study so hard after work in the evenings and I'm going to commit three hours Monday to Friday to do it. And I think if you can commit to that, perfect. However, when you delve a bit more deeply and two weeks later, I ask the same question. What did you do on your Friday night? Oh, no, I don't include my Friday nights. So I think, <laughs> OK, so again, I'm I'm more than happy for for students to 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 commit to other things on a Friday night. That's not my point. It's just be honest. Be honest about yeah, absolutely. what you mean by what you studying. really can do. Yeah. yeah. No, completely completely understand that as well. I think it's quite hard to at times, isn't it? Because you have these plans, and it's all, it's very easy to write a plan out and have intentions. Actually, doing them uh, can be a different matter with all those other distractions and you know life. Really, life gets in the way at times. So. OK, great. OK, step four then. Uh, choose how you wish to study. So this is partly a reference to the SWOT analysis that have been performed already. It could be that you don't need a tuition provider because your preference is self-directed study at your own pace using some learning material to read from. Absolutely fine. There are others that like to have things explained to them. There are people out there who perhaps left to their own devices. They might they might put off their study. But if it's timetabled and structured, that might help them. So it's just working out what type of learner you are and what kind of what do you want to get out of it. So 
it could be that you've chosen to either use a train provider or you haven't or to do distance learning course or an online live course or an online recorded or a classroom course so there's many different options out there but try to find the one that matches your style or, or needs or your convenience i think whatever you choose um, don't go through this journey alone you know, find some way to, to contact or to reach out, find resources, get advice. I just wish, Nick, and I'm ashamed to share this, I wish somebody had said to me in the beginning of the learning period, don't write out a textbook, Mark. So my very first course, I took the authorised text and I simply just wrote it out in my own handwriting. Oh, really? I think I did that because I got a sense of I'm doing something, I'm learning. I did for the first few hours, but after that, I found I was just writing for the sake of it. And I think it comes back to the, the, the point about the timetabling and the planning to succeed in terms of if you're going to commit you know, 10 hours a week to study, don't make those 10 hours ineffective study. And if I'd have been really honest with myself at the time, I probably look back and thought, is this really working? It just feels good. That's why I'm doing it. It just feels yeah. good. But actually, yeah. deep, deep down, I probably knew it wasn't the right thing to do. So again, be honest with yourself as to what makes for an effective study. Do you feel you are learning something? And I think that brings in the challenge of, I personally don't think reading is learning. Nick, what's your thoughts on that? Would you agree? Is it too passive? Oh, I, I have to say one thing I see a lot of students doing is is exactly that. What you just they will just read and they'll think, yes, I've read that chapter. I, that's it. And I know that. And what I don't see enough students doing is actually memorizing. It's one of my big bugbears is it's yeah, I've learned that. But what do I actually need to memorize? Yeah. In order to pass the exam, what's the question? Is it like the, the steps of absorption costing? Have I memorized that, those steps? And so um, I, what I would say is, yeah, I completely agree. Reading alone is not, reading is good for broad understanding. Absolutely. And you need that broad. And, and if you go, if you go to a lecture and you see someone, you know, give you that understanding, but ultimately, if you're going to do that, uh, that model, or you're going to be able to apply it, you actually need to go away and and firstly, memorize it and then practice questions to make sure that you've really driven that home. So, you know, it's that it's that mixture of kind of theoretical learning and then the active that I would really recommend is that 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 mixture that really drives home the learning in my view. Yeah, it's very true. So you can understand something, think you've learned it, but that doesn't necessarily mean you can recall it, which is the that's the point, really. So mm -hmm. we'll come on to another step shortly of, of, of how we can help to a recall. But uh, OK, so I'm just going to move on to section five, Nick. And, and I suppose step number five is to schedule your exam. So I'm suggesting here that at the beginning of your study journey, if you've got an end goal in mind, schedule it, put it actually, you know, actually book your exam at the beginning. The benefit there is you've now got something to work towards. And what that does, it heightens the senses. It means that your, you know, your periods of concentration as well, because you know you've got that end goal. So what we're finding is that those students that take longer to perform their studies are the ones that aren't scheduling their exams. Mm. And exams are very easy to put off. And again, we have done stats that show that those students that defer exams are more likely to fail. So have That's your end goal in mind, stick to it. Don't cancel or defer your exam. It's we'll something about motivation, isn't it, of having that specific. It's one of the things, you know, back in the old days when we took our exams, there was a date. You had to take the exam on that date and you worked towards it and you were motivated towards it. Now, you can defer for, you know, it's not the same on the case study, but on the OTs, you can defer. And I think there's something I do see students doing. It's like, I'll study until I feel I'm ready, then I'll book it up. And actually, you're almost never ready, and therefore it just keeps on getting... And, all, you know, those times when you were talking earlier about just pushing beyond, and, yeah, it's it's late, or it's, it's, it's not the right environment, you don't feel like studying, but you need to push on. Well, when it's 
three weeks away or two weeks away, you'll you'll push beyond. I've just got to get it done. And so, yeah, I completely agree with that one. It's something I've been telling, you know, I always tell all our students to do, is get it booked in. And then it links into your planning as well. It if you does. put it booked in, let's say it was 12 weeks, you've got it booked in for 12 weeks, you've got that plan for 12 weeks and you can't get behind then because you're, you've committed to yourself. No, I'm going to take that exam on that day. So absolutely. Yeah. And also it does mean if you've got an end goal in mind and you found that one week you can see in advance that you're not going to be able to do, for example, your 10 hours worth of study, then maybe you could do, you know, maybe you could commit to eight. Does that mean that you could do 12 the week before to catch up? So you're still on track. Everything is still within your control. One thing additionally is that senior students now have the choice to do their exams online and at home. And if yeah. that's the case, as you're scheduling your exam, just make sure that you run a systems check beforehand, a systems test. What we're trying to do is if you're, you know, you're going to take your exam using your, your home laptop or computer, you just need to make sure it's got the relevant bandwidth, et cetera. And just the easiest way to do that is you could just Google SEMA systems check and it'll take you through the links to the website to perform the check. It's really easy to do. You must perform that first because there'd be nothing worse than booking an exam and, and doing it at home and finding that you just don't have sufficient Wi-Fi. So such an important check. How, so, can, I just, yeah. can I just interject very briefly? And it's reasonably new doing all the doing all the online exams. And I, I did a uh, I did an interview just a few weeks ago about how's it all gone? You know, what's the what's the feedback like? What, what what's what's happened in the last few weeks since that's uh, been launched? Well, it's been very positive. I mean, we we are so pleased that we've had thousands of students take their exams online. And to be fair, we were nervous for them because this was something that. Um, was an option and the students could take the option to take these exams or they could wait for you know in center exams when they return and we're so pleased that they, they do seem to be returning now so students are just going to be able to have the option the, i think the, the the biggest feedback you know the greatest level of feedback was really it wasn't as bad as they were expecting okay because, you know That's so nice. um and you know nick it'll be no surprise that on occasion uh, globally, we did find that one or two students, uh, their, their Wi-Fi, they passed a systems test, but, you know, their Wi-Fi wasn't as good on the actual day. Uh, okay. And so, you know, uh, that was a struggle and, 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 and difficulty. And I think for the past two months, for example, I know that Sina yeah. has been um, uh, uh, providing free exam resets. So just to give people some confidence okay. in terms of yeah. If there is something that happens in their exam that we just can't 100% guarantee because we are reliant on home broadband. Yeah. But, you know, they've got a fallback and they won't be penalised there financially. Okay. Well, it's really good to hear. Really good yeah. to hear. Okay. Step six. So look for the right resources. Um, there's many things here. It's just, I think it's familiarity, first of all with what the exam will look like, the structure. And I know that people listening to this will be thinking, I now feel very patronized. Yet, and now I know this is going back a few years when the exams were in an exam hall and there were paper-based exams, but the very final exam, I walked out and my good friend turned to me and said, I was expecting four questions, not three. There were four questions, it was on the back page. Did you not sit? So in other words, familiarity is about, yes. you know, doing mocks, knowing that they might put questions on the back. So yes. there's an example of at the final level exam, somebody not being, you know, could have been more familiar with the paper, the structure and, and have done practice tests. But it's also, it, you know, it's it's other things, you know, in terms of um, on the SEMA website, we have uh, a great deal of resource and it's knowing, you know, which are the most important resources. So from a student perspective, I know the syllabus is important, but even more important is the blueprints because the blueprints is where the examiners get their questions from. Okay. So if I was thinking I, I kind of would like a, a full list of, you know, uh, questions the examiner might ask, well, they come from the blueprints. So you could work through the blueprints and there is one for every paper 
and check yourself. Do I understand that? Do I know that? Now that's a real exam focus. So, you know, that just gives you an example of, you know, just checking out what resources are there and, and, and why they're useful. And Nick, you must have lots of examples of resources at, at Strandy. What would you advise? What, what do you think are the uh, more critical ones for your students to? to yeah, hear? Well, I talked a little bit earlier about um, OT. So if I sort of talk about case study now, um, you know, and again, we talked earlier about pick and mix. So people can mix, pick and mix a whole variety of different resources that that we have. I think that without doubt, uh, actually, both OTs and case studies, mock exams is is possibly the most important thing. And what, one thing I, I always push for people is to try and get feedback on their mock exams. It's not so important for OTs, but case studies, because you know you can have a go at the question, but actually it's getting someone independent to review that and give you that feedback. And, and crucially, the advice on you've done that well, you're not doing this. But I think sometimes people think it's about, I got it technically right or technically wrong. So if I look at the solution, now I know the technical answer. But in my experience, that's a really small part of where the success is. Actually, it's about the way you've explained the points and are you writing it in the right style and are you planning it properly and are you pulling the right points out of it? And actually, that, that feedback, absolutely, absolutely crucial. Um, understanding, getting the, a real highlight of the pre-scene material, I think, is, is very important. And we have video analysis and we have um, written industry analysis and... We have our top 10 interest questions we think are likely to come up, you know, based on having looked at the precinct, um, which is normally uh, normally pretty accurate. And we have tuition videos. And, you know, there's actually there's people can look on the website at everything that we have. But if I would say what's most important, actually, I would say, yeah, understand the precinct, practice mocks, get the feedback on those mocks. Um, and, you know, that more than anything else is what I see being the the things that's most accessible. And I, I just, what, one other thing is what we often find is the first mock people take very, very rarely a pass when we mark it. And I, I think there's a lot of students out there who will go into the, their first mock is the real exam because they've they, maybe they've gone back and they've reviewed all the theory from the OT papers and they've, um, you know, and they think, yeah, I can answer those questions. And actually what they haven't done is they, they haven't realized that normally it's three or four mocks before you're really starting to get passing scripts that's what we find so I, i'd really i'd really advise that but also say have a look on our website we've got loads of things some free stuff some paid for stuff so you know there's, there's yeah. lots of things to, I th I, to be fair nick i think your point is spot on you know we, we work with a whole number of training providers and we therefore have a picture of what students are doing with their study and we are aware that there are some significant numbers out there of students that aren't doing a mock exam. And we have seen statistically that you are more likely to pass your SEMA exam if you have performed a mock. So that is an example of what I would call an effective SEMA study behaviour for, for passing the exams. I think, uh, I suppose this moves us on to the, the, the next step uh, Nick, I'm conscious of time a little bit yeah, uh, yeah. for the students, but uh, number seven is to create the right study space, the right study environment. So I know this one seems like a, a rather straightforward one, but is it really conducive for study? So um, some mistakes I made, I used to have a study uh, desk at home when I lived with my parents when I was going through my exam. I'd face a window and Oh, the tree in the back garden was the most interesting thing I'd ever seen whilst I was studying. In other words, it just proved to be a distraction. So eventually I cottoned on to maybe moving the desk to face a wall so there was less distraction. One of the, the, the more um, pressing ones more recently that's proven very distracting is a mobile phone. Yeah, and again, it seems obvious. And again, in a study period, I, I perhaps wouldn't put it in um, uh, my, uh, my, my my study environment at all. Um, in fact, I think whilst we're referring to study periods, I think this is a really important point and something I wish I had done myself. And that is, and you referred to it uh, earlier, Nick, as well, recall and 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 kind of reflective learning. So. Done, um, we've done uh, a little bit of work on this and I've, I've read 
widely on the subject of you know how long should a study period be and it does vary depending on style and personal preference yeah. what worked for me was chunks of learning so in other words thinking about a study journey of the whole e1 syllabus is like oh this is frightening but when you you chunk it down i'm just going to do one chapter and i'm going to commit to that chapter and if i do two chapters this week in my 10 hours then i'll still finish in three months time when i so in other words committing you know already ch you know chunking the, the chapters proved very useful and then within a learning period i found about 45 to 50 minutes tops was a, a reasonable chunk of learning for me to read to actively make notes to maybe question my understanding and do a question but after that you find my concentration level starting to drop so it's important to take a break there 10 to 15 minutes um try to avoid the fridge because that's what i used to do uh, I needed some reward. wasn't very helpful uh, uh, for me. Uh, but but the, the, when I would come back and start my next study period, I'd go straight into the next chapter. And that was a real flaw in the way I learned. I wish what I'd done was when I'd come back to that second study period, I would have reflected on the learn. What did I learn? What mistakes did I make? can I explain in my own words what I have just learned? And by doing that, I'm more likely to commit that to more kind of the medium term memory. Should have really repeated it the following day. What did I learn in that first study period? And what mistakes did I make? What did I do well? And, and again, uh, I'd be able to, if I could re remember all that, I'd be able to commit that to maybe medium to longer term memory. Um, and you can have as many study periods as you wish until you feel tired, but it's important to have that reflection at the end of those structured study periods. And that really is probably one of the most critical pieces of advice I could give a student is to what have you learned? And even the mistakes I made, I put them on little yellow stickies and put them on my bedroom wall. My mum and dad thought I was being a bit odd. But, uh, uh, yellow wall full of stickies, but there's actually technology out there like Mural that um, what I like about Mural is it's a virtual whiteboard and there's virtual yellow stickies. So you could have you know, virtual stickies that way. And, and I, I found that there were some papers that were really straightforward for me. And then there were some papers I found extremely challenging. And the way I learned was getting every question wrong. And when I was in the exam, I I knew what the right answers were because I'd made every type of mistake. And that's a really effective way to learn. So if there's anybody watching this that is currently struggling with a subject where they feel they're getting everything wrong, that's such a powerful way to learn. That I suppose it's the, the, the feelings of elation when you get a question right or the feelings of depression when you've got a question wrong. And it's those feelings that you attach to the learning. And that's very important for recall. So, um, I never really advise reading a question and then reading the back of the book, perhaps, for the answer immediately. It's too passive and you don't get those feelings of, you know, uh, uh, of sorrow or the feelings of success that come from doing a question at a time. Yeah, we've, uh, just, um, we've just been rewriting our study guide. So we have a study program for all our, our students and um, something we've just put into our new ones that we've just released is exactly what you said. We say on the first day, read the study text chapter. Then the following day, re read our revision notes because that's a summary of it. So you can do that quite quickly. Right. Then do the practice questions for that chapter. So that it's it's that re it's that recap that makes it go more long term rather than just you've just done it one day and then you revise it three days well, three weeks before the exam. You would have forgotten it in that period. So that little recap process actually works very very consistent with what you've. You've just been exp explaining. Absolutely crucial. Absolutely oh, I would agree with that. Absolutely. So we're, we're, we're yeah. nearing the end now. So yeah. um, step number eight, check your progress. Now, I wonder whether there are some students out there that can relate to this at the moment, that maybe they are a quarter or halfway through their study period and then, you know, their learning journey towards an exam. And they're finding that they haven't quite gone to the, you know, committed to the timetable because of, well, just life circumstances that get in the way. It happens to us all. And um, 
being, I think, aware of where you are at, what has worked well, a pat on the back for the learning that you have done. But what is it that you might need to adjust before uh, attempting the exam? And I think this is a really important point because I think it's um, it's it, it, near, where, near where I live, Nick. I know this is uh, an odd thing to say, but there's stepping stones across a river. OK. And I, I, it's wonderful to watch. My, my son adores going down to watch it because people go along the stepping stones and they get three quarters away across. And then there's one stepping stone that's slightly further than all the others. So the rhythm and pattern has changed. Now, that's the point that people seem to lose their confidence and fall in the water. And my teenage <laughs> son finds that hilarious. So my, my point is more, maybe there's someone listening that has got to a point where they feel should I defer? I'm not feeling confident. I should have been further ahead. It doesn't feel to be feel like it's going in. And it, it reminds me of a point that you mentioned earlier, Nick, in that nobody feels 100% confident. Nobody feels 100% ready for their exam. Nobody. And having uh, an understanding that you're in exactly the same boat as everybody else, I think is an important one. But I would look for what mitigations could I have? How could I increase my learning? What do I need to say to work or family members or friends or anybody else that can help to support me? Do I need to reach out to a strategy? Do I need to reach out to a tutor? Do I need to reach out to someone to say, I'm just at this point and I just need someone to talk to me, to, to help me through this? And it might be things like you might need to vary your learning. Maybe you've just got into a routine and you just feel oh, I, I, I need to, to learn a different way, maybe a podcast, maybe it could be uh, a journey in the car that hasn't been a traditional period of study that you might want to listen to something. So maybe it's learning in a different form to help vary it, to make it exciting or maybe make it more motivating. But I always, at this point, I always, again, said, come back to something I mentioned earlier. When I'm thinking about or listening to a podcast or listening to some learning, what does that mean in my own words? Can I explain what I'm trying to learn in my own words so that I could uh, articulate or write about it in my exam. Does that one make sense? It's a strange one. Yes, I it's that for my, kind of yeah. check and review so you know where you are, what's working, what's not, so you can adapt and change. You know, yeah. Absolutely crucial, I think, because you, know, you talked earlier about um, starting off uh, your study text and just, re just going through writing out the study text. It's recognising what is working, what isn't working, and recognising, oh, maybe that isn't the way to do it. I'll try this or I'll try that. So, OK, step nine. Stay connected. Stay connected. Um, you're not alone. Such an important one. Um, there may be someone out there that's um, listening to this who um, isn't in a cohort, doesn't have any peers. Uh, maybe they're in a place where everyone at work has passed and they, they say it seems so blasé about it. Or maybe you're studying somewhere where no one you know uh, is doing senior exams. And so stay connected. There's things you can do here. Um, uh, SEMA has its own Facebook page. But I think it's more important than that. I think it's the ask questions. It's a, uh, I, I mean, I was very lucky with the training provider many years ago that, that I used it. I remember my first lecture and thinking, this doesn't make sense to me. And I put my hand up in front of 25 students and said, I don't understand that. And then half an hour later, I find myself doing it again. I didn't understand that. And by the fourth or fifth time, I thought, I'm now slightly embarrassed. <laughs> Why not ask a question for a while? In my lunch hour, yeah. uh, the people I met became my friends for life. Still keep in touch with them now because yeah. they said, Thank you for asking those questions. Yeah. We didn't have the, 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 the guts to say anything, but we're so pleased you asked. And yeah. that was such a lovely moment. And that was a lesson for me, no matter what environment I'm in or who I'm with, never feel that peer pressure to, you know, to not ask questions and never feel as if, you know, I, I sometimes get students saying, um, I wish I contacted you sooner. I didn't want to bother you. But I think the point is that, for you and I, Nick, and, and your tutor team, it's an absolute vocation what we do. So when students do get in touch and say, what does this mean? Wonderful. That makes your day because you're able to explain something 
and, and provide them with some understanding they didn't have before. So in other words, it's not you're not bothering a tutor by asking or reaching out. You're actually making their day because you, you're, you're doing what we're, our vocation was. In well, absolutely. To help. And I, I, I mean, it's, it amazes me that the people that book on our courses, it's probably only 20, 30 percent of people that actually ask questions. Um, and and we, we I so much want people to ask questions. Actually, it's not just about you asking that question for yourself, because because yeah. so much is online now. You can put a question on a forum. The tutor will answer that, but everyone else gets to see the answer to that. You get to see the answer to everyone else's questions as well. And just the same as you were saying, it, probably everyone is questioning the same things. The things that you don't understand are probably the things that other people don't understand too. So, you know, it's that sharing of learning. Absolutely. Now, just anyone that's on our on our courses as well, we've got a course mentor that is there that's not a tutor. Um, she doesn't know anything about tutoring, but she's there to support you through if it's difficult, your study planning or anything that's not going well. And again, people don't get in touch with her enough, in my view, um, because, you know, she's absolutely there to support people and be there just to guide and um, just to be a, a shoulder to crown at times. Um, oh, gosh, so, I that's why I think absolutely. I really yeah. wish more people would ask more questions more of the time. It's just good for everyone that way. It really is. There is. I would have loved a mentor, Nick. I really would. But it, it also leads me to another point that's that might resonate is that I have met people, I have met people who ask questions, and when I tell them the answer, I can see they're not listening because I think what's going on in their mind is, Phew, I've asked that question. I'm really pleased. I, you know, and they sit back and they don't really listen to the answer, or sometimes mm -hmm. they listen to the answer but don't understand it, and they fear or feel scared about saying I don't understand so I again what I would I'd love and really encourage students to do is if you're ever in a position where you don't understand something is to feel free to ask again or, or to you know to challenge or, or what part does that mean or, or add depth to it so don't feel like asking one question is enough just keep asking questions until you understand it and every every tutor that I've ever met has has a a set way to answer something but then they have alternative ways because you might be learning you, know, you might be more of a visual learner or you might like stories and the story helps you to understand something so you know tutors will have various ways to be able to explain something and uh, but yeah and I, such an important well, point i think in this environment there'll be a lot of people that won't be on courses they won't be able to afford to do that but actually you know you can go onto the scene of facebook yep. we have our own facebook um, sites that's completely, you know, there's no charge for that. But other students will answer your questions as well. And other people yeah. that have been through that, they'll often give you another view. And I shall absolutely make use of that, even if you have, you know, if you don't have your own tutor, which is great if you have, but if you haven't, you know, there's so many, there's forums out there where people ask questions as well. And people are so well willing to, uh, yeah, to, to answer those. So absolutely. Okay. Your last step. Oh, well, number 10, this is just a well done. Well done, Nick, for getting this far. <laughs> so at this point in the journey, um, really, um, I, I, I've assumed that that the study period of learning is coming to an end and revision is about to start. And revision requires a whole new set of advice and steps, which again, are more than happy to cover on another time. But I think the key thing here is have you really done enough question practice or has your work been too passive? So in that learning journey today, it's been passive to active. And what I would suggest is as you move into revision is to change it round, active to passive. In other words, rather than start with some learning, digest it, test your understanding in a question, maybe at revision, you could just dive into questions, active learning. And if you get stuck, go to, you know, wider reading to find the answer. So. I tend to turn it round, and and I do think that you know I ask students if the, the, some of those um, situations where they've been unfortunate enough to be unsuccessful in their exams, I ask them why, and the number of times a student has said, I know why, I didn't really do enough question practice because it's more difficult than reading or listening to a podcast or looking at the textbook. It's just more difficult. The, that passive that passive learning it's easier and and I think that's the big thing you know really do challenge yourself have I done enough questions and uh, I think I would say 
you know, if there's someone that is listening to this and they're going through this journey, it's so worth it. So I'm going to ask you a question in a Nick to finish is, you know, what did it feel like for you on qualification? But for me, when I found out, I, I remember feeling relief uh, and then there's this euphoria that lasted, I think, about two weeks. If there's any Leeds United fans listening at the moment, you'll understand exactly what I mean because they've just been promoted. So feelings of euphoria, waking up and smiling. And it's amazing how your life changes. For me, it was a passport to to do what I wanted to do, which was to teach, you know. So um, as soon as I qualified, um, the, the place that uh, uh, I learned and, and studied with, I became a tutor. And it was definitely the passport for, for happiness in my life for 20 years of doing something that I love. So I, you know, I do hope that um, this has been useful uh, to your students, Nick. And I, I really wanted to wish them well with their studies and um, the best of luck with them. And I'm hoping that there's something in here that's been useful for them. Yeah, no, absolutely. I thank you for that, Mark. It's been a pleasure um, discussing those ideas with you and running some ideas past you as well. And so. Yeah, and some really useful steps. And like you said at the start, I think some people will be doing some of those things already, but I, I can almost guarantee that there'll be two or three of those steps that people will think, maybe I'm not the one, I'm the one not asking the question. Yeah, no, I didn't do the study plan, or I didn't, I didn't think of the why at the start and why it was all important. And I think if people can just take two or three things out of those, um, it will make a huge difference to people. So yeah, huge thank you. And thank you for coming along today. No, you're very welcome, Nick, and, and best of luck to your students.